Okay, class, let's get started. Um, we spent several classes talking about electrostatics, which just means static electricity. Uh, that's fun. We get, to talk, we get to make our hair stand up. We get to talk about lightning. But electricity, the, 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 lim the applications of static electricity are not that many. And so what I'd like, what we started talking about actually on Friday, what I'd like to fin uh, continue talking about today is not static electricity, but electricity electricity, the kind of electricity that moves. And we actually, <clears throat> without even really meaning to, started talking about static electricity, or we started talking about electricity electricity when we were talking about static electricity because we saw that st electricity doesn't stay static for very long. And so in the winter time, and I think it was Julia that asked about why it's more common in the winter. Yeah, in the winter time, uh, you're walking around and you build up a static electricity and you, there, that's static. You've got static electricity on you, static meaning not moving. Then you go up and touch a doorknob or another person, you notice that electricity did not stay static. It went from static electricity to normal electricity, which is electricity that's flowing or moving. And so we've even when you're trying to mess with static electricity, you, you quickly see that electricity wants to move. It wants to find ground. And so when you are walking around charged up in the winter time, you are actually at high voltage. And that all the electrons on you, all the electric charges on you want to find ground. Given an opportunity, they will. Lightning is also a very good example of static electricity. The the motion that happens inside a thundercloud generates very large voltages, very large accumulations of charge. And that's nice and static for a while till it finds an opportunity to get to ground. Now, whether you're dealing with just zapping someone due to static charge in the wintertime, or you're dealing with a Van de Graaff machine, or you're dealing with uh, lightning, in all those cases, the way that the electrons get to ground, the way the, the charge discharges, is it actually has to find a conductive path. So one way to find that conductive path is to just put your hand right on the Van de Graaff machine or to actually touch your friend. But the other way that we see conductive paths is the electric field generated by that high voltage actually ionizes the air. It actually yanks electrons off of air molecules and now you have your conductive path. That ionized air or plasma becomes the path. And when, that, when we see lightning, a lightning strike, all the, all the energy, all the electricity that's running through that lightning strike is going through a conductive path of ionized air to ground. So even when we're talking about static, we're still, we are talking about circuits, so to speak, in that we're talking about electric charges finding a route to ground, which they want to do all the time. And I think Lindsay asked about what happens when the power goes out and you got lightning hitting your power hiding your electric circuit and something going, a hopefully just a fuse blowing. And if you've ever had that, the if you ever had the power in your house just flicker for a second, uh, that was a fuse that was supposed to go, that was resettable, go and then just reset. That's a safety mechanism. That's good. If you've ever had your power go out and then the truck has to come out, sometimes sometimes the power goes out and then the truck has to come out. Best case scenario. A guy with a pole comes out and just has to replace the fuse. So there's these big fuses that'll blow. And today we're going to intentionally, yeah, today we're going to blow a fuse. And here's why you have fuses. You have fuses in your car. You have fuses in your house. You have the fuses in the power distribution system around your neighborhood. It's because often you get, for one reason or another, you get way too much current. You get some sort of electric discharge. And you want the thing, you want to be able to control what blows. So something's going to blow up. You want to be able to control that. And so the fuse in your car is just a little element that, given too much current, will blow. And you just go replace the fuse. Uh, when, lightning or, when lightning hits the power distribution lines outside your house, there's a fuse. It's about yay big. And hopefully that's the thing that blows. And you'll see a guy with a truck come out with a pole. And he'll, that pole will be very insulated, hopefully, and he'll go just replace, he or she will go replace that fuse. Now, sometimes the fuse doesn't work, and all of the systems they have in place don't work, and you actually just get a ton of current going through something. And that's usually when you hear a boom and maybe some flashes of light down the street, and that's your transformer blowing up. 
And that happens. So then they, the same guys in the truck come out, but instead of just putting a pole up, they got to probably take down that whole block and then replace the transformer. And that's when you're out of power for days. Or a tree knocks down everything. Then that's just, then you're out for days too. Okay. So anyway, today uh, we're going to talk about, a we're going to move away from crazy types of electricity like that toward more controlled types of electric circuits. And before we do that, I, well, in order to kind of as a lead into that, I'm going to give you an analogy that may help because uh, when we talk, start talking about voltage, current, batteries, and electric circuits, uh, it's, hard to stuff, it's hard to see sometimes. It's hard to conceptualize sometimes. So here's my analogy. I drew a picture. I hope you can see my picture. Here's what that's a picture of. That picture is a, it's a picture of a, big a tank of water. So imagine a big tank of water. What, one way to think of a, a tank of water, and we actually have these. It's, they're called like uh, water towers. So if you're driving down 29, you see a big tower labeled like Fluvanna or something. I don't know if Fluvanna's on Route 29, but you know, whatever. It's like Loudoun County or whatever it says. And uh, you see a big water tower. Here's one way to think of what you're looking at. Somebody has had to do work to charge up that system, to charge up that circuit. So when you turn on the shower or whatever in your house, what you're doing is you're, you're running a circuit. You can think of it that way. And so if you, uh, what someone has done is they've, they've had to expend energy and they've had to lift water above ground. They've had to take it and lift it up. That, w that took energy to do. That took work. So some pump of some sort was maybe run by coal or whatever, and they actually had to burn energy and get that water up there. Once the water's up there, it can be stored. So that's our battery. And a battery is a very similar system, whether it's a battery that you just bought at CVS or it's a rechargeable battery. In, in either case, something had to lift charges above ground. So in this circuit, what's going to flow is actual mass, actual water. Water is going to be kilograms is going to be my is going to be what I'm flowing. So I'm going to take actual kilograms, actual stuff, and lift it above ground. In an electric circuit, I'm just taking electric charge and lifting it above ground. But even our terminology is the same. In a in a in a uh, water tower, I'm taking something and lifting it above ground. In electric circuits, I'm lifting it above ground. And in both cases. Anything above ground wants to get back to ground. But in, if I don't give it a route, I can store that energy. So maybe a week ago, somebody ran the pump for a while and pumped all that water above ground. They, then they turned the, all the valves off, and it just stayed there. It was stored energy. That's what a battery is. So when you're walking around with a cell phone in your pocket, that if you've charged it, it has stored energy. You've kind of taken a bunch of stuff above ground, and it'll stay there. And it'll stay there for a long time until you finally give it a route to ground. And so in my circuit, I have got a little valve on the right there, and that valve controls the electrons flowing to ground, or in this case, the mass flowing to ground. And as I started saying last class, every, electronic, every electronic device you have is just a controlled flow of electrons to ground. That's it. So the, I mean, again, I, I keep pointing at these things because they are amazing. All the amazing things this thing does is just electrons flowing to ground. So when the screen turns on, that's electrons flowing to ground. When a, when a text message blasts out of the antenna all the way to the cell tower, that's just electrons flowing to ground. When I save a picture, save a song, that's just electrons flowing to ground and flipping some transistors. That's it. So all the amazing circuitry of our laptops and our cell phones and internet, all the, all the crazy electronics of mo the modern world is really just that. It's just electrons flowing to ground. And somebody had to take the electrons above ground and then in order for all that to happen. So the power company is usually the one doing that. So the power company is lifting electrons flowing to ground and uh, you either plug straight into the power company and as those electrons flow to ground you run your toaster or whatever or you plug in a battery which gets charged and that battery then is, has now electrons above ground and they flow. Either, in either case, all the magic of the modern world is just electrons falling back to ground. Okay, so in my circuit, I've got my battery, that's my tank of water, and then I've got a pipe sticking out of there. That's gonna be the path that, those, that the mass can get back to ground, but until the valves open, nothing's gonna flow. And as soon as I slowly open that valve, I'll get a little trickle of current through there. And I can measure that current as maybe like
kilograms per second, and I can measure the flow going out there. And as I open the valve more, I'll get more flow. And that is exactly how electric circuits work, and it's not really any more complicated than that. All that water above ground wants to get to ground. The bigger a pipe I give it, in other words, the less resistance to flow there is, the more current there will be. And once I fully open my valve, I'll get lots of current, and my battery will discharge, and I'll have none left, and I'll have a dead cell phone or whatever I'm messing with, and then I've got to charge it back up again. That's actually very, very similar to how all the battery-powered stuff of our life works. And now that just about everything is battery-powered, we almost don't have to even worry about the plug-in type. So my car and my laptop and my phone all run on, on batteries. My car doesn't. I, I wish I could afford a Tesla. Um, let's see. So yeah, that's, a, that's about it. So that's how, that's, I want us to have that in mind as we talk, start talking about circuits. And in that picture, you can see this, the three uh, the three measures that we started talking about on Friday, and that is voltage, current, and resistance. So the voltage is my battery. Voltage is a measure of, it's called potential, and it's just how much energy you've put into each electron. That's voltage. And again, like I said uh, last class, voltage is something, yeah, it's just a measure of how big your tank is. So I, I have a, up here I've got, that's a 12 volt battery. So if you have a normal car, uh, it's got in there a battery looks like that. That's a 12 volt battery. I think that's the only battery I have, up here, I have up here. I don't know how much voltage is in my cell phone. Three or five volts in that kind of cat that that ballpark, I think. Okay, so that my my water tank is my source of voltage. Then I've got a pipe or something. I need a conductive path to ground, and that's going to be my pipe. And how how big the pipe is or how open my valve is, that's my measure of resistance. And finally, the current, well, that's the other, that's the measure. The current is the flow. And in this case, current is measured in mass per time. I would say like, you know, pounds or, or kilograms, of, kilograms of water per minute, something like that. I think uh, a lot of times that's how plumbing is rated is, you know, gallons per minute, flushes per minute or something like that. Uh, in, in electric circuits, we measure in amps, and amps are short for coulombs per second, and a coulomb is a measure of electric charge. So that's the whole circuit. Let's pull up, um, let's pull up that picture. So there it is. My battery in this case is my source of voltage. So here we have a nice electric circuit. Now, as I've said, a light, a thunderstorm. I guess you could think of as an uh, electric circuit. You've got your voltage is the is the cloud. Your lightning strike is your path to ground, and the resistance is negligible because it's plasma, and plasma is a really good conductor. But for most of our modern life, we don't run our toaster off of lightning or anything like that. We've got these nice controlled paths like batteries and wires and stuff. Julia? Oh, good question. So Julia asked, uh, what would the voltage be? The voltage would be how tall my tank is. So the voltage would be, so that is a 12 volt tank, meaning it's a yay tall. And if I wanted, if you saw a twice as tall tank, that would be, that would mean the, the water at the top was tw has twice as much energy, and that would be voltage. Because technically, and that's, I'm glad you asked. So Coulomb is a measure of electric charge. And so I've mentioned charge is a fundamental property of the universe. Electrons carry charge. Electrons are our fundamental charge carrier. So electrons have charge. Voltage, technically, maybe we should know this, is a measure of energy per charge. It's literally joules per coulomb is a volt. So anytime we anytime um, we have units named after, I'm trying to think if this is, there's an exception to this. A lot of times when we have units named after a scientist, like volts, named after a guy named Volta, it's usually some compound unit. And so a volt is a joule, which is also a compound named after a guy named Joule, a joule per coulomb. So it's energy per charge. Yeah, and so the higher up my, my water is, the more energy each kilogram has. Good question. Okay. So there's my circuit. There's my nice, simple uh, circuit. Now, that's as simple as it can get, a light bulb and a wire. But I swear that all, you know, so that's as simple as it gets. But, I mean, the, your cell phone is just lots and lots and lots of versions of that. Your cell phone is just lots of battery, well, it's one battery, but lots of sources of voltage within that circuit, and current, and uh, wires, and it's literally wires, and little sources of resistance, like 
the light that lights up or the camera or the camera flash or the memory, all of that, all of those things are just little sources of resistance. And in fact, if you ever take your iPhone apart, you eventually will have to because you'll crack the screen, you'll take it apart, and you'll see there's actually little resistors in there, these little tiny little black dots that are resistive. Caitlin. Current. Yeah, so V for volts, R for resistance, and I for current. I don't remember why I is for current, but yeah, I for current. And there's the relationship I equals V over R. So the amount of current that's going to flow is going to be proportional to how big your battery is and inversely proportional to resistance. So if I have a one volt battery and a one ohm OHM, named after a guy named Ohm, I have a one volt battery and a one ohm circuit, I'm going to get one amp, amp short for ampere, French guy named ampere. So I'm, if I have a one volt battery and a one ohm circuit, I'm going to get one amp of current. Italian guy, I think a German guy, French guy. That's the relationship. Okay. Any questions? Great. Okay, let's. We're going to look at. Which one should we look at first? Uh, we're going to look at a couple examples of circuits like this. Um, yeah, actually, well, here's one other picture of my gravity analogy. So we're going to look at some circuits. We're going to look at some light bulb circuits. And here's a, here's a simple light bulb circuit. And again, I've got these little bikers on the bottom. I hope you can see this. Because, um, like I said, I, I like to think of height as my voltage. And so, yeah, maybe something I, sh I should also mention before we get to the actual circuits up here. Uh, all circuits, the word circuit, that is a complete path. So when I, in order to get current to flow, I need a complete circuit. So uh, the light bulb is off in that picture. So when I, I can plug a huge battery into a light bulb, and I'm going to get no light at all if it's not a complete circuit. So I can take a 1,000 volt battery and plug the positive terminal into me or a light bulb or anything, and nothing's going to happen because I'm not, I don't have current flowing. And the only way you get current flowing is if there's a route to ground, if you've given it a complete circuit path to ground. And so my little bikers are trying to represent that. So there's bikers there. Are, I've got some bikers on the right. They're at ground. The battery is the thing that lifts them above ground. So altitude is 100 meters in this case. So the battery is the thing that gives them energy, lifts them above ground. Once they're above ground, just like everything else in the universe, they want to get to ground. Unless there's a complete path, they're just going to stay up there at high voltage. Finally, get, plug in a light bulb, and that's what the filament is. This is a light bulb. Plug in a light bulb, and they now have a route to ground. And they will flow through the light bulb and go to ground. And by the way, if it's a light bulb, on the way down, they will bump into stuff and make light. And so that's how any light, that's how an, inc and how an incandescent light bulb works, is I've literally got electrons, little actual physical objects, that are literally moving through the wire, and they're bumping in to the filament, and all that heat gets hot enough and it glows. And so my conductive path is made up of wires. Wires are usually designed to be good conductors and not get hot. And so I've got some light bulbs up here that are used like normal wire. Wire usually doesn't get hot if you don't run too much current through it. But then the light bulb filament in the drawing is a bumpy road. I guess that's a pretty good analogy. So as the electrons are moving through the filament, the filament is made of something that is not easy to get through. So as we have to cram electrons through the, elect through the uh, light bulb filament, all the bumping, the electrons literally bumping in to the filament atoms are going to jiggle those atoms, get them hot, and they'll glow, and we get light, and also a lot of wasted heat. So let's try, let's try just one light bulb first. Okay. So right now, what you're seeing is basically that picture right there. And let's see. I also have an animation. I think there it is. Okay. So what you're seeing right here is. That picture on the left, and also I've got a nice animation there where I've got my battery or my source of voltage that's here. Yep, uh, I think I can zoom in on that. Okay. So this is my battery here. This is my source of voltage. What the battery's job to do is to lift all the charges above ground. Now they're all at that top plateau up there. They're all above ground. They fall to ground by running through the light bulb. And if, I, if this was not a light bulb, just a wire, they'd still fall to ground. 
But what a light bulb is, is just a path to ground that is going to also create light on in the way down. And like I said, all circuits that we use in, in modern technology are that. They're just me putting something clever in the way of an electron route to ground and getting something out of it. OK, so that's the circuit right there. Now, if I were to plug another, let's do, let's do this one first. So let's plug another light bulb in. So now I have two light bulbs, and hopefully, well, that one's a fifth, OK. Let's try. Notice, I don't know if you saw that, only one lit up. And let's try this guy. These are 225. OK. So let's see. Yeah. Hopefully, you can see that those two are dimmer than they were a second ago. So I've got, I now have two light bulbs, and they're both. They're a little bit dimmer than the one it was a second ago. Hopefully, you can see that. And the reason for that is I've got, let's see, I've got a picture of that. Yeah. Here's what's going on in my circuit now. I've got the power company is actually my battery in this case. So here's 120 volts. So my battery right here is, is that's the power company. That's 120 volts. Now, each one of those bulbs has to share that 120 volts. So the current, as it falls to ground, it has to go through two, through two light bulbs. And as it goes through the first light bulb, it's going to drop half of its voltage. So now it's at 60. And then it's going to drop another half on the way down and another 60 through the second light bulb. So each light bulb is only seeing 60 volts in that picture. Got that? So the brightness I see is proportional to how much voltage I'm putting across that light bulb. And so I've got two identical light bulbs. And they're each only seeing 60. They're each only seeing 60 volts. So it's not as bright as it, as one would be by itself. And I probably could put a third one in there. Let's see if I have another 25. I don't. Okay. I could put a third one in there. And this guy will probably. This guy might just take it all. Yeah. So I have uh, I have another light bulb in here that actually is not. These are each seeing 40, by the way. So it's not like they ran out of electricity by the time it got to this one. Sometimes people think that. Each of these is seeing about the same voltage drop, but that's a 60 watt light bulb. So let's, let's see if these guys will even turn on. So now all these bulbs are each going to see 40 volts. And they're all pretty dims now. So I've got, I still only have 120 volts, and now it's being shared by three guys. And each one of these is seeing 40 volts on the way down. Julia. Oh, good. Yeah, good question. Um, 60 watt bulb. Let's see. I have another. I'll pull up a slide for that. Julia asks, "What do I mean by 60 watts? Where'd my picture go? This one. I don't know if I needed a slide just to answer your question. P equals IV. That's why. But um, there it is. For a slide just for that. Um, Julia asked about." Wattage. So we've talked about voltage, Italian guy, current, measured amps, French guy, uh, ohms, German guy, if I remember right. And now watt. Watt, what was he? I don't remember what he, where he came from, England or something. But anyway, a watt is a measure of power. And I think we've actually talked about wattage and power before in this class, and it's energy per time. So it's how, much, how quickly you're using energy. So here's how that works. I have a 100 watt light bulb. What that means is it's, you, it's going to use 100 joules per second of energy. It's how quickly it's going to use energy. So if you've ever plugged in a 100 watt light bulb and it was really bright, then plugged in a 40 watt light bulb and it was not as bright, it's because the 100 watt light bulb was using 100 versus a 25 watt light bulb is using four times as much energy. So it's the rate of energy consumption. And so all of your appliances. You, I think all of your appliances are rated at how quickly they use energy, and it's their wattage. So I have a, um, I forget, my microwave is like a 400 watt microwave or something. So it uses 400 joules per second. Lance Armstrong puts out like 1,500 watts. That's how much energy per time. So right now I have three, I should stop using him as an example. He's Bad sportsmanship there, but I don't know who's our who, um, Ben King, the local super biker guy. He puts out probably 1,500 watts without drugs. So, um, 
So anyway, so here's here's three 60 watt bulbs, and they're each using they're each using 60 joules per second. And by the way, it's a product, and um, we may get to this today. Th that's an important thing to know. It's a product of current and voltage. And so when we um, the reason that's going to be important for us today or next class is that most of us don't make electricity at home. So unless you've got solar panels on your roof, you're usually paying the power company to send you voltage. Power, P, that's, that's, that's their job. And the power company is always dealing with this trade-off of we want to send you current, we want to send you power, and I have, they literally have to transmit it over long wires, and they get power losses as a result. And so. Uh, the power company is always worried about that product, P equals IV. They always want to minimize the amount of power loss getting to you. Because when you run current through a wire, you get power loss. Always. Pardon? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so um, the question is, is it better for the environment? The better, I mean, it's, it's energy per time. So it's how quickly you are wasting coal or wherever it's coming from. So it's how quickly you're, you're using resources. So the lower the wattage, the better. So it's either turn down the dimmer or get a LED bulb. Billy. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Billy asked about um, why different countries use different volts. I can tell you that. Why we all use different plugs, I don't know. That's annoying. So if you ever, you know, you travel abroad, you got to carry with you like 10 different plugs and a power transformer. Um, it's actually it's actually just convention, basically. So uh, yeah, it's pretty much just convention. So uh, the power in the U.S. The, the plug at the wall is 120 volts. In most of Europe, it's 240, and it's it's just a convention. It's actually there's a little bit of a trade-off. You actually get it's more efficient to be at higher voltage, so it's more efficient to be at 240, but it's also not quite as safe. Not that you know Europeans are frying themselves all the time, but it's a, just a trade-off. Um, it's the only reason. Just the convention. They just picked a number, literally. So they just they just picked. And um, we might have. We'll eventually get to uh, our 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 power is 120 volts at 60 hertz. There's 240 at 50 hertz. They just picked a number. Um, I, I think is the answer. Pretty sure. Okay. Um, okay. I'm gonna say something else about that. Okay. We'll get back to that. Um, so here I have three bulbs each. By the way, the term for this configuration is called series. And the reason for that is each one is in series with the other. So I have I, the electricity is literally going from one bulb to the next in series. That another, I guess, a, a definition of series is if you, if you go from one thing, you have to go from one thing to get to the next. Those two elements are in series. Now, if I were to hook up, now I'm going to hook up a couple bulbs in a different configuration. And I might be able to get the same brightness out of each bulb. So see, OK, these are all 60 watts, by the way. So memorize how bright those are. Those are all 60 watts. And if I take this 60 watt bulb, put it over here, let's see. And as I get running close, as I get closer running out of time, the likelihood I shock myself is going to go up. So there's two bulbs also being run off 120 volts, clearly brighter. So I want, to, I want us to see the difference. Both cases, what I have is the power company, right now it's right here, you can hardly see it, the power company giving us 120 volts. That hasn't changed. And what also hasn't changed is that the power company has lifted electrons 120 volts above ground. They really want to get to ground. They are running through this bulb to ground. They are now also running through this bulb to ground. That configuration right there is called parallel. There are two parallel paths to ground. Each one of those bulbs right now is they're both seeing 120 volts. There is 120 volts up here. Ground is down here. Notice both of those bulbs are seeing 120 volts. There's 120 volts across both of those bulbs. Let me find my picture. There it is. So in that, there's my picture of two bulbs in parallel. The power company has lifted all my charges 120 volts above ground. Those charges really want to get to ground. And so we mentioned last class, people have heard the phrase, 
Electricity takes the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance in that picture is all possible paths. That's how electricity usually gets, that's how electricity always gets the ground. It'll take all routes. So the analogy I've used before is that in a hall, if you have a hallway of crowded full of people and there's a fire or something and everyone wants to get out of the building, people will start taking the biggest route, the big wide hallway. That's how people will get out of there. Till that hallway is all jam packed, people will start trickling through the smaller hallway or find other routes to get out of the building. So the quickest way to safety is all possible ways. So when the big wide open hallway is full, you don't just wait, you go take the skinny hallway. It's the same thing. So all of, all, the electricity in this, in this case is going to take all possible paths and it's going to go through both 60 watt bulbs. In fact, I can put in a third 60 watt bulb, no problem. And the, so all three of these are now seeing 120 volts. So there's 120 volts going to ground for, through all three of those. That's three parallel paths. Any questions? Caitlin. Yeah, the 60 requires, it's a six, the 60 watt bulb requires more voltage to illuminate. And so when I had, let's see, yeah, I had three different, so I had the, what I had two, I think I had two 25s and a 60. The 25s have more resistance. And so they're going to light up first. Yeah, they have more resistance, so they're going to, they're going to, they're easier to, yeah, because they have more resistance, that's why they're 25 watts. So power equals voltage times current. They have more resistance, so they're going to use less current. Um, but because they have more resistance, they light up with less voltage. So I had three bulbs that were seeing the same current. Yeah, I had three bulbs that each were the same, seeing the same current. But the 60 watt bulb had less resistance, so it was just getting less hot. So these, the, the reason these are 25 watts is they kind of clamp down on the resistance, clamp down on the current. So all of these bulbs, each given, given 120 volts, will use different amount of current because they all have different resistances. 25 watt bulb, the reason it doesn't, it only uses 25 watts, has more resistance. So it clamps down on the current and gets hotter given the same amount of current. And that's another thing maybe I should mention that also is part of that picture, is the current flowing through, current is a conserved quantity. It, it, the current going through any loop is constant. So uh, again, if you think about the plumbing analogy, if one gallon per minute passes this bulb, that same gallon per minute is going to pass through this bulb and this bulb. In fact, that is a good transition to where I want to go next. Yeah, let's talk about that. So yeah, let, let's, I think that, that's a pretty good answer to your question, but also what we're going to go to next, I think will also help with that. So. Um, the current flowing through a, a series circuit is constant. And so the current flowing through this bulb, through this bulb, through this bulb, when I had all three of these bulbs, the current flowing through a series circuit is going to be constant. And as, so the, the current seen by the 25 and the 25 and the 60 was all the same. And the 25s lit up and the 60 didn't because the 60 was, did not have enough current to light it up. The current, as I add bulbs in parallel, I'm actually drawing more current. And you may have heard the term like that, my refrigerator pulls a lot of juice or something like that. Different, different amount of resistance is going to draw more current for a particular supply of voltage. So right now, the amount of, the amount of current that th that the power company has to supply right now is however much current is going to flow through that 60 watt bulb. Now there's 120 volts driving that circuit. When I turn on this second bulb, I'm actually just pulling more current. And as I turn this one on, I'm pulling even more current. So when I have, I have three bulbs each seeing 120 volts, I'm just going to keep drawing more and more current in that case. In fact, let's switch cameras. So right there, I have a picture of a fuse. And the reason I have a picture of a fuse, I want to try to blow that fuse. Here's how I'm going to try to blow that fuse. I have 120 volts over here. I have 120 volts powering this. This is a 60 watt light bulb. Then if I plug in a, six, a second, I think this is a 100, 100 watt light bulb. 100 watt light bulb is going to also pull a bunch of current. And that is all being provided by that fuse right there. So all the current through these two bulbs is going through that fuse. And that's coming from the power company. And these are in parallel. 
So every, t every, one I, every time I add one in parallel, I'm drawing more current. Now this is a, I'm kind of blind right now, I can't see it. I think it's a 300 watt light bulb. This should draw enough current. So again, power equals voltage times current. So if, you want, if this is 300 watts, that means it's going to be less resistive and pull more current for the given voltage. So there's 120 volts here, 120 volts here. And then when I plug this one in, I'm hoping my fuse will blow. So like I mentioned, a fuse is just that thing I intend to blow. So I'm about to pull too much current. And so something's going to blow. Either my extension cord's going to get hot and melt and it's under the carpet. I don't want that to happen. Or I'll blow this thing. Or the wire and the wall will blow. Then I've got to go tear my wall apart. You don't want to do that. And so usually you install a fuse as that thing that will intentionally blow when you pull too much current. So let's try that. That was fast. Did we see that? OK. I'm going to do it again because it was pretty fast. So as soon as that bulb, and now notice they're all out. So as soon as that bulb turned on, I pulled too much current, and the fuse just got so hot it died. So I've got two more uh, fuses. I'm going to try to swap those out. Let's try that again. So there's my fuse there. I'm going to keep your eye on the fuse. I'm going to try to, I wish I could blow it slowly, but as soon as I get current, it's just going to go. Do we need to see that again? I have another fuse. I'll leave an extra fuse just in case we need it later. Um, and by the way, here's another example of that. Uh, so that fuse just got so hot it vaporized. And let's see, if you were to come up here later and look, yeah, there was a wire running through this fuse. So a fuse, you can see the, a fuse is just a piece of, it's, a, it's, a, it's two conductive caps and a little wire running through. And that wire just can't, pulls, can't carry that much current, and it evaporates. Here is a pretty good example of the same thing. Here I have a car battery, 12 volt, hooked up to a, a pretty resistive wire. And let's see if I should put that on camera. Let's see. It's glowing. I think, can we see that? Okay. That is, that's getting, I can even smell that from here. So that wire is so resistive that 12 volts through it. So it's very low resist, it's, it's actually very low resistance, I should say. That's a very low resistance wire. And so a ton of current is flowing due to 12 volts. So uh, I equals V over R, so take 12 divided by like 0.01. And you're going to get a lot of current running through that wire. And it gets crazy hot. Let's try that again. And it gets so hot, it, as we've seen with incandescent bulbs, it glows red. And at, just in case that is not visible enough, let's try. Yeah, that's that's hot. So there it goes. So that's enough to. Ooh. Okay. Okay. That is still on fire. Okay. That's good enough. Go out. OK. Um, we have five minutes left. Oh, we had a new eye clicker. OK. clicker of the day. So when I have a simple circuit, here's a good example of a simple circuit. When I have a simple circuit like this, again, uh, there is physical objects moving through this circuit. They're called electrons. So there's literally electrons moving from the negative terminal, they're negative, they're electrons, moving from the negative terminal through these wires, then back to the positive terminal. So I actually have physical objects moving through here. How fast are they going? So when I turn the lights on, or I turn a flashlight on, or I turn my cell phone on or something, how fast do you think those are going? Pretty much not moving. A slow, like, yeah, pretty much stationary. They're, for some reason, they don't move at all. 
I guess, yeah. Uh, maybe B, a slow walking pace, like yay slow. C, so maybe in the, in the neighborhood of 100 miles an hour. Or D, around the speed of light. More resistance is going to lower your wattage. Yes. Higher wattage is going to pull more current. Okay, take 20 more seconds. Faster, yeah. You know, once you hit the switch, electrons are going to start flowing in the flashlight. How fast are they flowing in the flashlight? Ready? Hang on. Okay. Can I go now? Okay. Okay. When you, when you turn on a circuit, let's talk about maybe the light switch at the wall or something. When you turn on a circuit, something does move the speed of light. And it's just the information that you turn the switch on. Stuff starts moving in the circuit. And think about it this way. When you close the switch, when you close the switch, the electron closest to the switch learns that you did that. And the electron farthest from the switch learns you did that a very, very short amount of time later, and that information travels the speed of light. But while the switch is closed, while the switch is closed, the electrons themselves are going about this fast. It's a very slow walking pace. You could easily outrun them. And so right now in this room, electrons are flowing from the power company through the lights to ground. It takes them probably hours to complete their actual path. The information that, hey, the lights are on, ha makes it through the building at about the speed of light. But the electrons themselves take time. That is probably a good place to stop. See you Wednesday. <laughs>